Alright, Assalamualaikum Ooh, Sorry Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And a very good afternoon everybody Um, So today is our last lecture uh, I hope you are happy so that you don't hear my voice anymore Um, I'm just, just joking Okay, uh, so while waiting for your friends to come in um, So last week I mentioned that we'll probably do some uh, What do you call it? Um like practice quiz, okay, but um, it's very unfortunate that I don't think we will have time to actually do that. Um, so what we'll do today is we'll just try and finish the lecture and um, we'll try and see um, your understanding on the concept that is being taught to you today, okay, because I know today involves a little bit more biology rather than um, chemistry, but uh, I will still try my best to try and make sure you guys um, do understand what I am talking about, even though it's biology. Okay, how many of us are here now? About half. Never yeah, mind, because I'm recording this. So for those who actually missed it, um, for the early part of the lecture, you can just go back to Spectrum and um, I will post this recording as soon as I, I've got it, okay? Um, one more thing is that since you will not be doing any tutorial for this section per se, and on Thursday you will have a quiz including today's lecture, so I will try my best and post a um, kind of like a practice tutorial questions for you guys to have a go. Okay, I will try and post it by tonight. If I can't make it by tonight, then I will probably post it uh, in the morning, like 12 o'clock, like, like for this lecture notes. Okay. Um, and so you, you will have a little bit of time to actually go through uh, what kind of question that I might ask. Um, and um, on Thursday, you will have your second quiz. Okay. And then you have one week of um, study week. Then you'll have your final exam. I'm not sure whether it's first week or second week, but um, then you'll have your final exam. And of course, final exam will include everything that um, you've been taught at, including to this lecture. Okay, all right, so um, QR this for, oh God, my, my auto admit system is not working again. Oh, now it's working back. All right, so um, QR this for your attendance, scan this QR for your attendance, um, code is exam is near. Okay, so we'll just do that. We have. Uh, never mind. So for those who actually missed your attendance, just go back to the recordings and you will see. Okay? All right. So we are here now. Um, last lecture for nucleic acid and the last lecture for the whole course. And then next week, we will have um, your quiz. Okay? Um, and the final exam, we've already prepared. Um, Dr. Dini and I have already prepared the questions. So... Um, I, I'm not sure if Dr. Dini will have another session for with you guys to, I don't know, give a tips or something, or she already did that. Um, but in my case, um, basically, if you want to score, as long as you answer all the questions that I posted in tutorials and in the recorded lectures, um, and you understand the concepts, then uh, I don't think there will be any issues for you to get um, a good score, okay? So mostly quizzes will be difficult, right? Havinesh, the quiz is always very difficult, um, but then the final exam normally it's um, easier, so to say. Okay, all right. So um, last week we stopped over here. Okay, um, it's a quick practice on how you can translate um, HI peptide into RNA codon. So HI is histidine and isoleucine. So how do you actually um, translate this? Okay, so a simple translation would be um, to find histidine and isoleucine. So histidine is, let's see, where is histidine? Histidine is here, okay, and then isoleucine is over here, okay, so these two. So for you to translate it into RNA, of course, because if you look at over here, one amino acid can, code, can have three different codons, Okay, and for histidine, there's two codons. So there are multiple ways for you to actually answer this. So as long as you manage to um, 
answer this properly, then you will be fine. Okay. So one option is for you to answer it as C A U A U U. Okay. So ciao ao. Um, so because this one is H and that one is I. Alternatively, it can be C A U and then A U C or C A U or A U A. Okay. Because all these three uh, different codons still codes for the same amino acid, which is I. Alternatively, you can still, you can use the other one, which is CAC, with all these three combinations. Okay, so to the other day, there are a lot of combinations. As long as you know or understand how do you actually do this, then it's fine. Okay, now, how about if I ask you guys, can you translate this particular uh, peptide into a DNA codon instead of uh, a simple RNA codon, I'm asking you to do a DNA codon. How do you actually do that? Okay. Um, and I will leave it to you guys to actually solve that one. Uh, because of course, to the other day, I've already, um, what was it, showed you this slide. Okay. So this slide talks about, um, and this one as well. Okay. So you should know that DNA sequence, <coughs> when you have um, translated Transcript it, transcript it into an mRNA, then the sequence needs to be a complementary sequence. Okay, so you have an mRNA, and then from mRNA, then you will have, uh, you can translate it into peptide. Okay, but in addition to that, you also have a, um, a anticodon. Okay, so these three things, uh, the same thing, they are all genetic information, they are all nucleic acid, and they all have their own relationship. Okay, so DNA to RNA, RNA to anticodon. So what are the relationship? I'll leave it to you guys to actually think about it. Um, it's not that difficult, it's just very straightforward. Uh, but this could be something, uh, type of questions that I might ask you in the final exam. Okay. <coughs> all right, now. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, today we're gonna go into the uh, more on the technology or what are the applications that you can use uh, when you know the concept about nucleic acid. Okay. So you've learned about proteins. You learn about peptides. You learn about sugar. Um, you've learned about what's the other one? Lipids. And now nucleic acid. So what can you use it for? Okay. So today we're gonna um, looked at the huge potential of this um, field. Oh, you, there's multiple names. You can call it genetic engineering. You can call it genetic technology, um, RNA technology, DNA technology. So anything associated with uh, the use of genetic codes and engineering or technology. Okay, so it's a very, very broad field. And of course, since it's broad, um, the application is also very, very, um, it's a lot, uh, uh, so to say, okay? So, um, we will look at a bit, very, very basic principle. What are the principles, okay? And then, um, of course, the application is a lot, as I've listed here, okay? So, these are all genetic engineering. So, probably a long time ago, you've heard about um, cloning, okay? So, very recently, is human cloning in China. Or, or, well, basically, it's CRISPR in human, okay? So, a long time ago, way back in, if I'm not mistaken, 1995 or so, uh, some of you might heard the story about Dolly the sheep. So, you can just Google this if you um, have never heard about it and you are interested in, in just looking at what are the potential of uh, genetic technology, okay? So, this is the first clone organism, basically. So... The mom clone itself, of course, with human intervention. Um, so it's actually give birth to its own self. Um, and um, there are some issues with it, but uh, that is basically the first uh, time by which cloning was um, shown in a full multicellular organism like this. So a very complex organism. So before this, you can simply clone one single cell into multiple cells. Okay, So these identical cells, so these are 
all the old school cloning, but um, that one is already uh, being done once. Um, it's not mistaken, it's more than once, but at least it, it, it was a success, so to say. Okay, of course, um, there are many ethical issues. Uh, for example, if you clone yourself again and again, uh, do you consider yourself to be, um, you know, a god then because you never die? But um, that's a different story. Anyhow, um, we also have uh, genetic modification and one of the technology is using CRISPR. Okay, there are multiple technologies that you can use to do genetic modification and CRISPR is one of the best and it's actually quite recent. If I'm not mistaken, it was, it was first discovered in about 20... Uh, and around that much, so about 10 years ago. But uh, originally, it was just dis discovered. Um, there were very like minimal use, but today, um, CRISPR is being used in a lot of things. Um, of course, genetic technology, genetic modification, including um, what they call it, uh, trying to fix um, genetic diseases. Okay, so as you uh, remember, if you remember, about two or three lectures ago, we talked about how a single mutation of peptide um, can cause sickle cell anemia, for example. Okay, and sickle cell anemia is not just um, because of one amino acid uh, mutation, it's basically due to a single nucleic acid changes in the genetic code. So, a person who develops sickle cell anemia will definitely pass down the genetic code. Oh, well, at least have a 50% chance to pass the genetic code to their progeny, to their uh, children. Okay, so um, by knowing how our genetic um, works and what we can do to actually um, kind of like fix the genetic codes. So CRISPR is one of the technology by which is very, very uh, precise um, in terms of it can go down to like a single nucleic acid change. So for those who actually develop um, sickle cell anemia, whereby it's actually embedded in the genetic code. So CRISPR one day, hopefully, or probably a different technology than CRISPR, uh, but, you know, a genetic technology um, application might cure these people who have um, like a bad genetic code. Okay. So that's the reason why we are learning about this. Um, so it's not just about simply knowledge, but um, towards the end of the day, the application makes it um, very, very good to be learned. Okay. All right. And of course, uh, everybody knows about this. So we have Pfizer um, and, and BioNTech collaboration developing the first mRNA vaccine. Okay. Even though um, RNA, mRNA, and so on and so forth has been recovered for so long, but um, the first application in um, vaccination was shown last year. Okay, so this is a very, very recent technology. So we will look at this a little bit. Okay, we will look at that and we will look at um, PCR in general. Okay, so those three things. All right, these are just to show you guys the, some news um, about the uh, technologies that I mentioned. So China CRISPR twins. Okay, so um, it's actually the children was developed to make to make that they to make sure that their body is resistant to HIV. Okay, so that is the first because HIV binds to a certain protein before it's actually infecting the cells and in the body. So what this um, Chinese group did was to modify the protein so that uh, HIV will not bind to the protein. Therefore, they uh, the children are resistant to HIV infection. Okay, so it sounded like very very good. Um, however, there are a lot of ethical issues. Um, for example, what will happen to their children? Will the genetic be passed on? Uh, will genetic be converted into something which is more dangerous? Uh, because if you go and learn about um, cell division per se, whereby the, the genetic codes were um, randomized and so on and so forth. So introducing a new gene might introduce a new type of disease in the future. Okay, so that is one of the ethical concern about um, genetic modification in human. <coughs> Additionally, you can use genetic code. Okay, so this was back in you know, 30 years ago from 2016. So in about 1980s or 1990. Okay, it was the first 
example by which a, a genetic technology is being used in a criminal investigation. Okay? We will talk about the basic theory behind this um, in the next few slides. Okay, so that one is the same, CRISPR baby, Dolly, um, is the clone chip that I mentioned just now. And then, um, of course, about mRNA and the COVID vaccine. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so principles of genetic technology. If you go and just simply Google genetic technology or DNA technology and so on and so forth, they, they are actually a lot of definition. Okay. Um, of course, the definition towards the other day uh, catered towards the same thing. Okay, but I just like to quote um, Encyclopedia Britannica. So um, the Encyclopedia wrote genetic engineering or the artificial manipulation, modification and recombination of DNA or other nucleic acid, okay, in order to modify an organism or population of organism. Okay, so uh, basically what is more important uh, from this Encyclopedia Britannica is artificial manipulation. So it can be... So if you know how to synthesize um, nucleic acid, okay, you can synthesize the nucleic acid in your lab. So a full synthetic nucleic acid. That is what um, our Pfizer and biotech vaccine is. It's a total synthesis of mRNA. So it's not made of from biology, uh, even though originally the research comes from biology, but um, the production of the vaccine is a total chemistry. Um, so, you know, um, that's, that's why we just learn about the principle and as a chemist, you can actually learn a little bit more detail and apply it uh, in the chemistry field. Okay? So modification and recombinant of DNA or other nucleic acid. So this one, of course, because of nucleic acid, it's involved everything. RNA and different types of RNAs that we've shown previously. And whatever nucleic acid that is um, still not known in the um, universe. So um, if you manipulate, modify or recombine, recombine it in any way that you want, it falls under the principle of genetic technology, okay? So um, for me, genetic technology is a manipulation of DNA RNA for technological purposes. So for me, it's more broad. Over here, it says to modify an organism or population of an organism, um, but to the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you modify an organism, you know, as you can see in the next few slides, whereby we are using, um, well, you've heard about PCR, right? Polymerase chain reaction uh, from this COVID swap. Okay, so the PCR itself is a technology based on genetics. Okay? It's originally found um, by a chemist, as I will show you um, in the next few slides, but um, to the end of the day, we don't create any new organism. What we did is just we use the um, technology available um, and um, for a specific purpose, okay? All right, so genetic technology can also, uh, if you try and find, it can also be put under the definition of biotechnology, which is utilization of biological entity for a scientific or systematic application, okay? Why biological entity? Because as you see um, in the next few slides, we will use in PCR, for example, we will use an enzyme, okay? So an enzyme is normally being produced from a biological entity. Even nowadays, even though um, you can synthesize an enzyme in the lab, but um, to get um, a huge quantity of enzyme, we still um, use a biological platform, either cell-free assay or in cell or plant cell and so on and so forth that we have covered um, previously, okay? So to the end of the day, call it what you want, DNA or RNA technology or whatever. Um, to the end of the day, it's a manipulation of genetic material. Okay. So what is important is the set of nucleic acid is used for a specific purpose. All right. Can you see what I see? Okay. So definition is not set in stones, but resolve around utilization of the DNA and RNA and its derivative for a purpose. For example, we will see um, next is mRNA technology for COVID-19 vaccine, PCR technology. Okay, so these are the two technologies, okay, um, two genetic technologies, mRNA and PCR, but then um, each technology can be used for different purposes. One is for swap test, and the second one is for DNA fingerprinting. Of course, for mRNA technology, I'm just giving you guys one example. So for this lecture, we will go through these three examples. 
Um, hopefully, we will manage to finish on time. I have 50 more minutes. All right. So first thing first, the mRNA vaccines. It was pioneered by uh, BioNTech back in 2020. Of course, they have been developing um, a lot of mRNA technologies for so long, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for more than 10 years, since 2020, uh, 2010. But they have yet managed to actually push the technology forward, meaning that there are a lot of hurdles, there are a lot of regulations that stopping them from pushing this technology to the market. But um, because of COVID-19 um, issues and um, what the BioNTech uh, CEO did was uh, he actually talked to a Pfizer. So this technology was developed first by this guy, okay, this group. And then they promoted, uh, they, they worked together with Pfizer to try and commercialize it. So um, the story goes, uh, they, they have the technology um, for, to synthesize the mRNAs. And then uh, once COVID sequence, um, you know, the spike protein of a uh, COVID was identified. So the sequence, uh, the amino acid sequence was identified. And then from the amino acid sequence, of course, you can straight away translate it into um, mRNA sequence or even DNA sequence. So what they did was they had a talk with Pfizer because, of course, if you want to market this um, technology, you need a lot of money. And Pfizer and Modena are two huge um, pharmaceuticals companies, and they have a lot of money. So what the uh, CEO did was he went to Pfizer, uh, did a discussion, and Pfizer agreed. Because at that time, Pfizer was doing a vaccine based on proteins. Okay, So Pfizer is doing um, on the S, S protein, the spike protein. But BioNTech, they have the technology to develop from mRNA. Therefore, from the, the collaboration between those two comes the mRNA um, vaccination to produce spike protein. Okay? So the technology utilizes mRNA to produce protein, as we all know. And genetic information in the form of messenger RNA or mRNA is protected by lipid nanoparticles from um, rapid degradation. So... Um, our genetic materials, if you remember on our last lecture whereby I'm showing you the cell, the three-dimensional shape of a cell, and the nucleolus, which contains the DNA, the genetic material, is being covered by a lot of layers, right? So this is because um, mRNA and DNA are very, very easily degraded. Okay? Uh, if you put it in a high temperature, not that high, I would say, I think if I'm not mistaken, about 80 degrees, it will straight away like um, the, the phosphate bond will just break. Okay? So it's that's why you need to protect it very well. And therefore, in Pfizer and Moderna's case, they are protected by lipid nanoparticles. Okay? mRNA is transferred into the host cell test promotes translation of mRNA to protein. Okay? So uh, in this case, is the spike protein is being generated. So if you look at this picture again, so now what um, the Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech did was to produce this. Okay, synthetically. And then uh, protect it into a lipid, within a lipid like that. Okay, and then deliver it into the body. And then from the body, while the mRNA inside the cell, this happens, the ribosome will now translate um, the mRNA sequence into a polypeptide, okay? And then the polypeptide will be displayed on the surface of a cell, or the terminology is cell express the uh, spike protein, and therefore the immune system comes in, identify the spike protein as a foreign object, and thus develop um, antibodies against the spike protein, okay? So that is generally how the... Um, uh, vaccine, mRNA vaccine works in, in basic principle, of course. Um, towards the end of the day, immune, immune system is very complex, but what you need to understand is that this process, okay, the transfer of mRNA into a cell, and then how the mRNA is be, being translated into the spike protein, and then the spike protein being um, uh, expressed or, or shown on the surface of a cell, and then the immune system comes in, identify, and produce an antibody, okay? All right. So as you know, mRNA doesn't simply go back into DNA. So if you heard anyone saying that 
if you take a vet COVID vaccine from Pfizer or whatever, um, it will be integrated into your DNA. Okay, so those are all false information. So that's why learning about what we are doing today is actually beneficial in terms of um telling the public or probably your parents or your your cousins. Uh, I don't know, um, whoever is close to you about what are the real situation. Okay, it doesn't simply um, delivering RNA and then it becomes your DNA and then you become a mutant. Okay, it, it doesn't work that way. Okay, even you don't have that when you use mRNA vaccine because it starts from here. Right, so nothing like that. <coughs> All right, so this is just uh, another representation of what actually happens. Okay, so you have um, your cell expressing spike protein and then immune system um, being produced against the spike protein. And this is one example, the first example of genetic technology. Genetic technology. Or if you want to be specific, then RNA technology. Okay. Yeah, just an example. Um, the what else can you do from a, a genetic technology? Okay. The second one, which is polymerase chain reaction. Again, it's related to COVID. Um, it's just because we are still uh, uh, forcing through ourselves in the COVID scenario. So might as well, I'll just teach you guys. When you heard about uh, KKM mentioned, um, QTPCR analysis says that it's a positive, this one says it's negative. What does it mean and how do they actually do it? Okay, so PCR machine is like that. It's a very small tabletop machine. We call it as thermocycler. Okay, and why does it mean as thermocycler? In chemistry, what does thermo mean? Thermo means heat. Okay, cycler. What does a cycle mean? So, well, what, what, that, what is a cycle? Cycle means it's a cycle. You keep on repeating it. Okay? So that's why you see here, M cycle, third cycle, second cycle. Okay? Thermocycler means that if you actually look at the, um, I don't have a space over here, probably over here. Okay? If you um, do a time and the temperature versus the temperature, what you will see is, as the time goes, you start off at probably uh, room temperature, say 25. What you'll do is the machine will fluctuate the temperature like this. Okay. Normally it's around 70 to 50 degrees. Okay. So it's, um, it, there's a cycle of temperature. So each one of these, okay, is called as one cycle and then two cycles, three cycles, and so on and so forth until the end until the end cycle. So the end cycle is actually depending on how many cycles that you want, okay? So how does a PCR works? How does a polymerase chain reaction works? Um, it's like as I've shown over down here, okay? So the basic, well, before that, you need to know that the technology was developed by Kerry Mullis and he is a chemist. So, you know, for all we know, one of you guys will develop another technology based on the biological principles that you guys learn. So even though you are a chemist, but it doesn't stop you from utilizing the bio biotechnological perspective to actually develop something that can be useful to humankind. Okay, That's what this um, person did. He's a chemist, uh, but he developed the PCR technology that is widely used in the biological field. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the basic principles for a PCR is basically it's uh, a copy machine. So it's a photocopier. So it's either duplicate the genetic material. So it can be DNA, it can be RNA. As long as it's the genetic material, it can duplicate it. And how it did that is like this. Okay. So say, for example, um, first off, you have your DNA or RNA template. Okay. So, um, We'll just talk about the principle first, then I'll go back to how you actually use this for um, the swap test, okay? So first you need to have your genetic materials, so it can be DNA or RNA. And then of course you need to have your um, DNTP. So DNTP is basically uh, the nucleotide triphosphate, okay? Uh, deoxynucleotide triphosphate. So um, basically it's another type of uh, nucleic acid, but it's a, uh, 
uh, triphosphate. So if you recall our structure of RNA, so you have one phosphate at the five end, and then you have your ribosugar, okay? And then uh, you have your base, all right? So that's the basic structure. So this one, what it has, it, it has uh, three phosphates linked to one another. And why do you need this? Uh, basically, this is, uh, this lowers the uh, activation energy, which is being used to form a bond because you want to grow the DNA uh, or genetic materials, all right? And then what else do you need? So you need to have one, the genetic materials, two is the free nucleotide, number three, and number four is for you to have a polymerase. So it's an enzyme that uh, catalyzes polymerization of um, genetic materials. And of course, you need to have primer. So what does... What is the function of a primer? For a primer is a set of nucleic acid sequence that serve as the starting point for duplication. Okay, so imagine if you have a single RNA like that. Okay, and then you have a free uh, nucleotide floating around, and then you have a polymerase um, enzyme. So without primer, how can where, where can the polymerase actually bind? So for it to copy, if you look at this one, this figure uh, number three, okay, for the system to copy the, the um, genetic materials, it needs to have a starting place, okay? And the starting place comes from primer. So that's why we call it as primer. Prime is, um, um, in Latin means, if I'm not mistaken, uh, first or number one, Something like that, okay? So it's a starting point by which um, the, the original um, sequence will be copied, okay? So if you want to copy that one, right? So you need to have a primer with a sequence that is complementary to the um, genetic code that you want to copy, okay? So that the primer will bind or what we call as annealing, okay? So it will anneal to the sequence based on a, its complementary sequence. So say, for example, if um, the mRNA sequence starts with AAA, as an example, okay? So if the primer has a sequence of TTT, then it will bind to the sequence and start um, the uh, extension process, okay? However, if the primer, let's say over here is, um, C, okay? So if the primer now has a sequence of TTC, then it will bind to this section before it actually starts to copy, okay? So a primer also have its complementary um, sequence. We don't call it as anticodon, but um, the sequence of uh, a primer can be similar to a sequence of anticodon, okay? Because it's a complementary sequence. That is what important. Okay, so first off, what we do is in thermocycler is to heat it up. Okay, when you heat up, when you heat it up in the first thing, um, in the first half over here, okay, what it did was it separates, it breaks all the bonds in the middle of the DNA, if you are using a DNA. If you're using an RNA, then it's not critical, okay? And then once you heat it up, it will split into two sections, okay? It will split up into two sections. Now, Depending on your primer, okay, so you might use one uh, primer or you might use two different primers or you might use even 10 different primers. Okay, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is you know the sequence of the primer and then you can get the primer to bind at the specific region of the um, genetic material. Okay, so once it starts to bind, okay, normally the temperature is now being lowered like that. Okay, so that um, now all amino acids, once you lower down the temperature, molecule starts to slow down a little bit. Okay, so once it starts to slow down, and of course, um, the primaries, polymerase will come in and then help to ligate the sequence. Okay. What does the ligation means? What I keep on saying ligation, what does it mean? So you have your first 
um, nucleate, nucleotide. Okay. And then you have your second nucleotide. So how do you actually combine these two nucleotides? Okay. It doesn't work spontaneously. Right. So you need something to actually help the nucleotide to actually uh, form a bond. So that's why you need to have this enzyme. This enzyme functions uh, as to lowering the activation energy between two nucleotides, thus forming the um, connectivity. Okay, so uh, from a five prime N that has a, a triphosphate, so the energy will be extracted from the breaking of the triphosphate bond, and then uh, the energy will be used to form a different uh, additional bond to the adjacent uh, nucleotide. Okay, so that is the extension process, and it normally happens over here. And as you recall, I mentioned um, in the previous lecture, our body, uh, in the human body, uh, synthesis works very, very quick. Okay, so similarly over here, in a short duration like that, okay, so it's probably around one, uh, probably 10 or 20 seconds, depending on how you set your time. So it could be 30 seconds, it could be one second, uh, probably not one second. Say, for example, if it's one minute. So for just the sake of um, theoretical perspective, if it's one minute. So in one minute, this enzyme can move very, very fast and probably be able to copy uh, like 10,000 um, nucleotides, um, not copy, ligate. Okay, so manage to combine a thousand nucleotides. Right, so you don't need a lot of time. So that's why this one cycle, if uh, my biology is still uh, correct, is about 15 minutes. Okay, normally. So one cycle, go, I'm going, temperature going up and then going down. Okay. So once you have a copy, right? So once now you have two copies, the cycle starts again. So the machine will ramp up the temperature and what will happen is the bond in the middle here will break and then you will have another two sets of um, genetic materials, okay? Of course, because originally you have two and the copying occurs in both ways, then you have four copies after your second cycle. Okay, on the second cycle, you already have four copies of your genetic material. <coughs> and then uh, once the cycle is complete, then you now have eight copies of the genetic materials. And then on the third cycle from eight, now it becomes 16. 16, it becomes 32. And so on and so forth. Okay, so basically the number of copies is two to the power of n. n is the number of total cycle. So if you have 10 cycles, then you have 2 to the power of 10, which is, I don't know what, uh, I need to find a calculator, but um, the more cycle that you have, then the more do, uh, numbers of copies that you will have towards the end of the day. Okay, so how do you actually use this PSCR technology in a swap test? Okay, so swap test is, um, so the technology that is being used is called as QTPCR, QT is just stands for quantitative PCR. So what it does is it determines the number, the copy number of um, the genetic material. Okay, so as simple as that. So number of genetic material. So you know that if you're just talking about general PCR like this, okay, so you can just go on a thousand times and then towards the other day, you will get like, I don't know, one gram of genetic material, for example. Um, but in QTPCR is you can actually determine at what particular cycle, what are the number of copies that is uh, already available, right? And it uses uh, fluorescent spectroscopy to actually determine the concentration of the sample while doing the copy, okay? So the higher number of initial genetic material, the faster it reaches um, the um, fluorescence. So say, for example, if you look at this um, purple line, Okay, and bottom, at the bottom here is number of cycle. Okay, and you can see that uh, probably starting at um, 20 cycle, then the number of copies starts to um, goes up. Okay, so it starts to amplify in a high amount of um, uh, manner. Okay, so it starts at about um, probably about 21 cycle. Okay. 
if you comp uh, compare it to the black line, that probably starts off at about thirty four cycle. Okay. Um. Can I ask someone to to tell me which one has an initial um high number of genetic material? Anyone must try. Which one has a high number of uh, genetic material? The black one or the purple one? Purple one. Oh. Purple. Okay. So that is how um, the swap test works. Okay. Um, and to visualize this, I have a theoretical case study. So a person A and a person B had a close contact with a positive patient, a person C. Okay. As per our KKM SOP, both individuals need to do a swap test. And the swap test came out as person A, uh, red line, person B, orange line. So red line is this one. And second one, um, this one is A. And then this one is person B. Okay. And as you mentioned, person A has a, a higher initial copy number of um, genetic material. Okay. So based on um, KKM SOP, so this is an internal SOP by the medical doctors, um, I was told that if the amplification starts below 20 cycles, then this person will be considered as a positive case. Okay, and in orange, um, it started at about, well, probably around 30-ish. Okay, so say for example, it starts at 30. 30 is a number by which to show that the uh, number of COVID viruses in the body is now decreasing. Okay, the copy number, the viral load is already decreases because from the swap test, the so you, you did a swap test, okay, individual A and B, if the viral load is high, this one viral load is low, then it you need less cycle to actually get a threshold, okay? So if you consider, say, 200 as a threshold, okay, because again, towards the end of the day, uh, what KKM does is they want to identify whether the viral load in an individual is high or low, okay? If the viral load is high, it means that the person is recently being infected by COVID-19. If the copy number is low, meaning that uh, the body has already, um, you know, killed off most of the virals. The virus is still there, but most of it has already uh, been killed. Therefore, um, for a person orange, they might just need to do a self-quarantine. But individual A originally will be transferred either to an isolation area by the government or in a hospital depending on the um, degree of the symptoms. Okay, so that is how PCR is actually used in our COVID-19 test. And if you go back to RTK technology, RTK depends on antibody. Wait, RTK, is it with you guys, RTK? Or is it a different subject? Now I'm confused. <laughs> okay, uh, I think it's a different. Okay, sorry, that one is uh, for a third year subject. So uh, uh, just scrap what I, whatever I just said about RTK. All right, so this is basically the... Um, the idea of using PCR into um, swap test. All right, so the final example, the third example is um, about DNA fingerprinting. So you can still use PCR. Um, it's another technology that is being used to identify you guys based on your DNA. Instead of using our fingerprint, uh, we can actually identify in, uh, each individual, each of us is actually unique in terms of our DNA. Um, DNA uniqueness, all right? So even though we all have the same genetics, okay, but, well, I'll just go from up here, okay? So we know that everyone is unique in their own way. So gene is being turned on and off. And from this, we have different phenotypes, physical appearance. Some people are um, uh, tall, some people are shorter, some people have um, different types of eyes, different types of nose, different types of ears. 
different types of um, tongue. So some people can twist their tongue. Some people can make the tongue become you. Okay. Some can't. Some people can actually try and uh, make their tongue becomes uh, kind of like bulging. Some people can't. And I am the type that can do this. But none of my family member can actually do this. Okay. So that is what we call as phenotype. It's a physical appearance. And this physical appearance comes from how our gene or genetic materials being turned on and off in the body. Okay, so everyone is unique in their own genetic too. And not only that, we have multiple copies of what we call as non-coded um, um, genetic materials. So either non-coded DNA or non-coded RNA and so on and so forth. This non-coded genetic material codes for nothing. Okay, um, it doesn't code for anything. We do not know until today, scientists do not know why do we have that uh, particular non-coding uh, genetic materials in our body. But in the positive side is this non-coded sequence are transferable from parent to child. Okay, and by doing this, because it's being uh, transferred to a child, so say for example, um, so these are the process. Okay, so you have your DNA sample. It's the same thing as um, how PCR is being done. So you have your genetic samples. You um, do the extraction. Now you get your genetic materials. You do PCR with labeled primer. So that's the only difference. The first one is just a simple primer. Now we are using a primer with a label. Okay, and this primer is specific for a, a set of non-coding sequences. Okay, oops, what did I do? Right, so from there, you can uh, PCR your sequence, and then from your PCR sequence, you do electrophoresis, and then you visualize, and then from there, you know that, oh, okay, this person has this much of uh, PCR with label yellow. This person probably has a small one. This person has a huge number of green. This person, ha uh, this person has no orange, for example, and no green. Okay, so each one of us has different ratio of this genetic material. And so far, as of last year, um, because that was the last time when I've read all this genetic material, we had um, at least 20 different locations by which you can do a PCR. Okay, so 20 unique primers in our genetic materials, whereby uh, a combination of these 20 um, sequences makes us who we are and it identifies you based on your parents, okay? What do I mean by that? Is say for example, the parents has one yellow, one green, one orange and um, no, no that green, so uh, cyan, okay? So a parent has this three and then a mother has yellow, um, red and cyan but no orange and no green, okay? So the child, because uh, genetic material can be passed down from both parents, the probability of the child to have orange, uh, sorry, yellow, red, cyan, and orange are rather high, okay? And no green. So say, for example, um, I was murdered, okay? Someone, one of you guys killed me. And then uh, my blood goes into one of you guys, okay? So uh, people can will be able to uh, actually take a blood sample from the disease and take the blood sample from the crime scene, do PCR uh, fingerprinting or DNA fingerprinting. And then from there, you can actually find who is my parents and who actually killed me, okay? Especially if the blood, uh, my blood goes into one of the killers, whoever you are, okay? So this is how DNA fingerprinting helps in criminal investigation, okay? So for example, if uh, a police managed to get that particular DNA from the crime scene, okay? And then based on the crime scene, you have three suspects, and then from each suspect, they will take a, um, a DNA sample and then do a PCR as what I've mentioned just now. And then from the genetic materials, from the gene, gene, genetic fingerprinting, you know that suspect A, suspect 1 has this type of genetics, KB, number 2 has this, number 3 has this, and so on and so forth. So 
police can actually compare the genetic material from the suspects and the crime scene to be able to actually say, okay, suspect two is definitely at the crime scene because we find his DNA at the crime scene. Okay, so this is how DNA fingerprinting works in the criminal investigation. Um, therefore, well, of course, now you know that suspect number two. And then why? It's because of the genetic material or DNA fingerprinting shows that suspect number two is actually um, at the scene of crime. Okay, so this non-coded DNA or genetic materials, even though it does not give us any um, phenotypic appearances, but it can be used to profile an individual. Okay, um, and that is all for today. And that is all for um, today's or uh, this semester's lecture. I do hope you um, enjoy the information as much as I enjoy teaching you guys. Um, even though whatever I'm teaching here, by no means uh, going into very detail, but I do hope that uh, it will beneficial. It can be a beneficial for you in one way or another. Okay. So that is all from me. Um, thank you and um, good luck in your quiz and in your final exam. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doctor. 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 Be safe, everyone. Have a great day, Doctor. Bye. Bye, Nisha. Jelly, tak dengar. Boleh cakap apa-apa ke? Eh, Vinesh, dah habislah. Bye, Vinesh. Bye, Jelly. Bye, Afaf. Siapa lagi di situ? Siti Nur siapa ya? Siti Nur. Baik Siti Nur.